Hi, I'm Joe Roth. At New Jersey Sharing Network, we're committed to saving and enhancing people's lives through organ and tissue donation and informing people about our life-saving mission. That's why we're proud to support programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by Delta Dental of New Jersey. Everyone deserves a healthy smile. The Healthcare Foundation of New Jersey, founded by the Jewish community. Kessler Foundation, changing the lives of people with disabilities. The New Jersey Reentry Corporation, New Jersey State Nurses Association, and the Institute for Nursing. New Jersey Sharing Network, dedicated to saving lives through organ and tissue donation. And by Community Food Bank of New Jersey. Promotional support provided by NJ.com, Small News, Big News, True Jersey, and by Meadowlands Regional Chamber, building essential connections that drive business growth. This is One on One. I'm an equal American just like you are. The jobs of tomorrow are not the jobs of yesterday. Look at this. You got that? this? Here it is, man. Look at that. Life without dance is boring. <laughs> when you first heard that they were doing Charlie Rose and Gail King, didn't you go, what? Do you enjoy talking politics? No. People call me because they feel nobody's paying attention. Our culture, I don't think, has ever been tested the way it's being tested right now. That's a good question. High five. Welcome to One on One. I'm Steve Adubato, and this is Christina Weiss Laurie, President of Eagles Charitable Foundation, also Eagles Social Responsibility. Good to see you. Good to see you. We're not just talking about any Eagles, we're talking about the Eagles in Philadelphia. We are. Set up that connection for us, the <laughs> Eagles and the Laurie family. We started our Eagles Charitable Foundation under a different name, Eagles Youth Partnership, in 1995. Um, when Jeffrey Glory and I bought the team in 94, we knew that we were getting something wonderful in terms of a football team. You know, it had a great history, had an amazing, passionate fans. But what we didn't know was that we, we also had a platform with this team with which we could hopefully um, do lots of positive impact, positive change in the community. And that was a surprise, especially to me, because, you know, I grew up in London, um, knew very little about American football. Um, and or Philadelphia. Or Philadelphia. <laughs> but no, 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 my dad was born in Philadelphia. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. And, um, but it was a gift in, in terms of, I got to know the city, I met lots of different people, and I wanted to maximize this opportunity. And so Eagles Youth Partnership, which then became Eagles Charitable Foundation, um, became this um, opportunity to, give, to work with the community, mm. to work with our fans, to give back. And um, we focused on comprehensive vision care for kids and recently autism. Let's talk um, about the autism challenge. So. I'm not sure if you're aware of the Pan Mass Challenge, which is this bike challenge out of Boston. It raises millions of dollars for cancer. Autism is this bioneurological disorder that affects the development of the brain. It's underfunded. Um, not enough people are aware of, of how many children are impacted. One in, um, I think, 42 boys is born mm. on the spectrum. The numbers are- The autism spectrum. On the autism spectrum, the numbers are, are huge. And so when you, we looked at this, the success of this bike challenge in Boston, um, I thought, why can't we do something similar for autism in Philadelphia? And that was the start of the Eagles Autism Challenge, which will take place next May, our first cycling challenge on May 19th. Talk to us about um, the NFL is such a bottom line. I don't mean it in a bad way, but a business. And um, I happen to, you know, I love football giants, and there's been a long time rivalry with the, the Eagles. The spirit of wanting to give back beyond the bottom line, where does that come from? It's back to that platform that I mentioned to you before. Um, we have this incredible group of guys, our players, and you look at the children that are in our communities, and they look at our players as their heroes. And why not take advantage of that and figure out where are the holes where we can actually plug and make a difference? So one of our first draft picks was Jermaine Maybury, and he was legally blind in his left eye. Mm. Had he gotten vision care? 
he would not have had those issues. And that's what helped. Germain was a big factor in helping us figure out that we should focus on vision care. Because one in five kids has vision problems. Mm. I don't, 80% of learning in school is visual. If you can't see, you can't read. If you can't read, you can't learn. And you and have it was an that simple. Excuse me for interrupting. You actually have an initiative to deal with that. Is it a yeah. mobile van, is it? It's, we have an Eagles Imobile. It's an Imobile. 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 And we have a glasses lab that follows the, the Imobile, and we screen kids, and we give them um, comprehensive eye exams and glasses if they need wow. them. And, um, and then we've, you know, one of our successes is that we partner with, we have great partners and we have great supporters. And so Will's Eye Hospital, for example, and Children's Hospital in Philadelphia, they are partners in so many of our endeavors. And we couldn't do it without them. What is Go Green, the Go Green initiative? Go Green is our rallying cry on the environmental front. We're a green team, color-wise, but we're a green team in terms of the environment. And when we built our stadium in 2003, and we got our first power bill, we were shocked. I mean, you can just imagine, you know, we host the largest parties in Philadelphia on game day. Um, and obviously, unless you're blind and deaf, the environment also me is, the, is, is... It matters. It, it matters. And so we tried to see what could we do? How could we... Um, gradually go off the grid? How could we be environmentally conscious as an organization? And so over time, and it wasn't you know, overnight, it became a process. Um, we compost and recycle 99.9% .9 of our waste. We have over 11,000 solar panels at the stadium that um, pr create four mm. megawatts of energy. And that covers all our energy needs other than on game day. We buy clean energy, we reforest, we, when we travel, we figure out how many trees we'll, we should plant, you know, to, to balance that out. You know, we try and, you know, think about how we can be, you know, a, a business, because this all has to work for the business bottom line, too. That's right. You know, if you, if you conserve on energy, on the energy front, you can afford to do these changes. Um, and... Um, on game day, millions of eyes are on the team. And so the stadium is, is this great um, example of what a business can do um, on, on the green front. It's impressive. And as we do this program, the Eagles happen to be having a good season. We hope that continues for them. But Thank way you. more importantly, as an organization, you're making a difference in the lives of so many people who need that help. And I want to thank Christina Weiss. Lori, President, Eagles Charitable Foundation, Eagles Social Responsibility. I want to thank you so much for joining us. Steve, thank you. You got it. We'll be right back right after this. To watch more one on one with Steve Adubato, find us online and follow us on social media. We're pleased to welcome Dr. Jim McGinty, who is Chief of Surgery and Surgical Services at Englewood Hospital and Medical Center. Good to see you, Doctor. Thank you for having me. Let's talk about uh, weight loss uh, surgery and how it's changed, just say in the last five to 10 years. That's well, your, one of your areas of expertise. That's correct. So weight loss surgery has changed, uh, really the, the way we think about the disease of obesity has changed over time. Uh, weight loss, or I'm sorry, uh, obesity is a, a chronic condition and it's a, it's a growing problem in our, in our country. Uh, what we now understand about it is that once you reach a certain uh, weight over your ideal body weight, 80 to 100 pounds, for example, or more, you're really locked into that weight. What do you mean locked in? Well, there's a center in your brain, the hypothalamus, that actually uh, is the set point that controls your weight, sort of like a thermostat would in, a, in, a, in an apartment. And uh, that weight is set, and for whatever reason, we don't understand the mechanism, but for whatever reason, in patients who reach about 80 pounds over their ideal body weight, that becomes their set point. And really, everything they do to try mm -hmm. to lose weight is undermined by that part of the brain. So for instance, many times patients will come to us and say, I've tried everything. I've dieted. I've lost about 30 pounds or so. 
and after about six months, I'm still they eating the same thing. They come back six months later and they're starting to gain weight again. So research has now shown that it's this set point that is uh, driving that mechanism. Mm. And really what happens is that as you start to lose weight and come down off of that set point, your body thinks you're starving. And so it slows your metabolism down, it increases sure. your hunger and your appetite, and by the, by the end of six to 12 months, you're, you're back to where you started. Different types of options, describe them for weight loss. So really the most popular one now is the, called the vertical sleeve gastrectomy. All of these surgeries now are done standardly through small incisions, what's termed as laparoscopic surgery. So uh, the sleeve gastrectomy is a operation where we remove the baggy part of the stomach. If you think of your stomach as a bag, we're really just removing the part of the stomach that uh, holds extra food and we create a tube out of the stomach. And the way that works actually is to remove a part of the stomach that makes a hormone that is an appetite stimulant. It's called ghrelin. Mm. And ghrelin is a very powerful appetite stimulant. And when we remove that part of the stomach, what we see in, in, in the blood is that the hormone level decreases almost to, to zero. And what patients tell us is that they just don't feel hungry as much as they did before. You don't eat as much. You don't eat as you much. You don't want to eat as much. That's right. And it's not that patients are coming in and saying to us, you know, I'm so hungry and I just want to eat and uh, it's getting stuck as I'm trying to mm. eat because it's too tight. It's more that they just don't feel like eating as much or, or um, feeling as hungry or cravings for foods that they Is there another have. procedure that we should mention? So the one procedure that we've done in the past uh, and we've been doing for decades and it's a very uh, effective operation is something called the Roux and Y gastric bypass. The bypass. The bypass is where we make a small pouch out of the stomach but then go downstream on the intestines and divide those and bring it up to that pouch. So essentially you're diverting the food stream around the main part of the stomach and, and around the first uh, few feet of the intestines. And so for a while we were thinking that that also worked because of restricting how much you can eat or how many calories you, would, you could absorb. But really what actually happens is that it changes the hormones mm. that communicate to that center in your brain. So, uh, and in the last five to 10 years, we've actually uh, discovered dozens of these hormones that are made in the intestines that talk to the brain and the other organs that will uh, uh, reduce your appetite and boost your metabolism. Doctor, real quick on this, uh, post-surgical care, describe it. So that's also changed in the last uh, 15 years since I was in training. Uh, in the past, we would do most of these operations through a large incision. And so the patients were often in the hospital for days, many complications, uh, hernias, wound infections. Uh, nowadays, because we're doing it laparoscopically and because we've refined our technique and, and uh, are all accredited by a, by a quality assurance board, our techniques have, have improved. So now patients are often going home the same, uh, one day after surgery, typically back to work within a week or two. One wow. day, yeah. So recovery is very different. It is. It is a lot less pain, uh, and the recovery pathways that we've developed have uh, mm. really enabled patients to get started on their diet much faster than they have in the past. For Alexander, here, give some advice to patients struggling right now. He or she should do what? They, who should they talk to? Well, unfortunately, obesity is a multifactorial disease, meaning that there are many, many different causes. Uh, the environment that we live in, the, um, the uh, foods that we're presented with, uh, and so uh, genetics is involved as well. But I think if you're struggling with weight uh, and a vast majority don't qualify for weight loss surgery but really need to focus on uh, eating the right foods and that means no processed foods, uh, really trying to go mm -hmm. with what God put on this earth, you know, vegetables and, and uh, fruits being the main thing and avoiding the processed carbohydrates and, and uh, fatty foods. But if you eat. need help, there's nothing wrong with asking what options are out there at a certain point. Absolutely. Okay. I think this is a difficult disease to go through without help. And okay. so the resources are out there, your, your doctor, your primary care doctor, nutritionists, and uh, behavioral psychologists, mm -hmm. all can be a, a powerful uh, help to, the, to, to uh, support patients you who are trying to lose weight. You just a lot of people, doctor. Thank you I so much. So. We appreciate Thank you coming for having in me today. as part of our ongoing discussions with clinicians from all walks of life who are making a difference in, in the lives of other people. Thanks so much. It's my Stay pleasure. Right Thanks there. for having me. We'll be right back right after this.
To watch more one-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato, find us online and follow us on social media. Welcome back to One on One. I'm Joanna Gagas, sitting in for Steve Adubato right now. I'm joined by two folks from Caldwell University. First, Dr. Kathleen Kelly, who's the Associate Professor and Assistant Director at the School of Nursing and Public Health at Caldwell University, and Natalie Pedri, who is a senior in the nursing department also at Caldwell. Wel welcome, both of you. Thank you for having us. Thank you for having us. Beyond the terrific work that you're both doing in the nursing program, uh, there's a really, really powerful personal story here. Natalie, I'm going to start with you. Mm -hmm. uh, you were in your junior year at Caldwell, applying some of the techniques that you had learned from Dr. Kelly and in the program, and had a really powerful personal discovery. Tell us about it. Yeah, so I had Dr. Kelly my junior year um, in the fall. She was my professor for health assessment. And in that class, we learned all about how to assess ourselves. Um, what does that mean, assess yourself? To, well, when, you have a, when you're a nurse and you have a patient, you have to assess them, like listening to their hearts, um, checking their lungs, and also feeling around their bodies to make sure that they don't have anything abnormal going on. Um, so I was completing a self-assessment my summer before entering my senior year, and I found something in my abdomen, and it, was, it felt very large, and I didn't think that it felt right. So I had actually had an email from Dr. Kelly sitting in my inbox that was like, hey, Natalie, you missed your assignment, but I was thinking about, I, I just missed it because I had so much going on, and like, I was thinking about like what, what this could be. So this was consuming your mind. You felt yes. something, you were concerned by it. It started consuming you. Did you think it could be something? But what did you think it was? I had no idea. I was Googling stuff as Usually anybody not would a do. good idea. No, it's right? not a good idea. So you find the worst by that prognosis. time by that time I had like ten different cancers and right. a bunch of other diseases. So, so what I, did you do? What did you discover? I actually answered Dr. Kelly. I was like, hey, can you give me a call? And she's like, are you okay? I was like, no. So I explained to her what was going on, and then she told me I should go see my doctor. And after a bunch of scans and testing, I got diagnosed with stage 4 Wilms tumor, which is a pediatric cancer. Um, that is probably not a very commonly understood or known cancer. Explain just a little bit what it is, what the treatment was like for you. So it's a rare kidney cancer. Um, it usually happens in children under five years old. So when I got diagnosed, uh, it was a big shock to my team and as well as everybody else. Um, so I had to go through surgery to remove my kidney and the tumor, which was almost, uh, a, it was over a foot long. So it was deep in my abdomen and they removed the kidney and then they found that it was in my lung as well. So after they did that, they started chemo and radiation. So I went through uh, six months of chemo um, and I went through 14 days of radiation. And how are you doing today, Natalie? I'm doing well. I finished my treatment in March, and now I'm just starting my life after cancer back in the nursing program. So you're back at the nursing program, back with Dr. Kelly. Mm -hmm. Dr. Kelly, as you're listening to this, you are teaching the most basic and important mm -hmm. elements of healthcare, one of those being assessment not just of the patient but of yourself. Uh, you yourself have a personal story to share with mm -hmm. cancer. Tell us quickly. So I was, I went for my regular mammogram and they saw a spot on my mammogram and I went for further testing and I had uh, breast cancer. And when I went to, uh, had the first biopsy done, it came back a particularly high grade, which is not um, a good diagnosis. So although the stage was early, the grade was not good. And I immediately went in for a radical mastectomy with chemotherapy and radiation to have done. And it was uh, tagged back because of the makeup of the tumor to the work that I did at the World Trade Center. Wow. I was a healthcare provider at the World Trade Center site. That has to have carry with it a ton of emotion, right? Um, but were you, you're teaching at the time that you get this diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Were you open with your students at the time about what you were going through? from the very beginning. Why? I was, um, because we're nurses and nurses share and nurses learn. And the way that nurses learn is by understanding what's going on with their patients and understanding what's going on in the community. And I needed to educate my students that breast cancer could happen to anyone. And I wanted them to share in the journey with me and learn firsthand what it was going to be like. And for them to understand how this was going to affect me and they were absolutely amazing when it came to me. 
with, with their support. They all wore pink ribbons. They were wearing pink shirts all the time. Mm -hmm. They were just absolutely amazing and supportive. There's a secondary level of, of something that's going on here that I'm seeing. It's, there's the clinical side, right? And what you're teaching in the classroom, the self-assessment, mm -hmm. the importance of understanding how to do an exam, not just on someone else, but on yourself. And then below that, below the surface, what there is is this human connection. Mm -hmm. And it's you with your students and your students being able to trust you and understand that you're open and honest with them. And I see that you reached out to Natalie to say, is everything okay? Something, mm -hmm. you had a sense that something wasn't mm -hmm. right. Why is that human connection so important, not just as a healthcare professional, but as an educator? Well, at, at Caldwell, we have a very, very um, tight-knit relationship with our students. That's one of our best attributes at the university. And it wasn't like Natalie to miss something. And I had a nagging suspicion that something wasn't right with her. And when she called me, she had the trust to call me and tell me what was going on. I said, Natalie, you need to go see someone. And then I immediately started looking up, <laughs> what could this be? And I came, that it had to be a Wilms tumor. And then she called me and said they were sending her to Sloan and that they thought it was a Wilms tumor. And um, so I started to support her going through because yeah. I could answer her questions honestly. What was chemo like? What was right. radiation like? And coaching I, her through that process. Coaching her through. I sent her the shirt I wore through my <laughs> chemotherapy yeah. for her to wear, and then she did the same for me. It's like the sisterhood of the traveling shirt. Right? That's yeah. exactly what it is. <laughs> yes. And last question for you, Natalie. How has this experience impacted your goals as a healthcare professional? Well, now it definitely is a change in career for me because I definitely want to go into pediatric oncology now. I think that as a nurse, I could help my patients the same way that you know, my nurses helped me, like Dr. Kelly helped me when I was going through it. So I think that I could be a good asset to a pediatric oncology team now that I've had that experience, not only as a nurse, but, you know, as a patient, because it's a whole different side from, you know, it's, it's hard being a patient. It's not easy, and I never realized it, but now definitely I have more compassion and more empathy, like, for my patients. I can't thank you both enough for coming here, sharing your personal stories, and for all the work that you're doing to help others. So thank you so much. And don't go anywhere, because we are coming back with more one-on-one -on -one right after this. To watch more one-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato, find us online and follow us on social media. See, when you come to the stroll and roll here at, uh, in Verona Park um, with the Kessler Foundation folks, you don't know who you're going to run into. He's known this guy for a long time, Scott Chesney. Scott, you were here pretty much day one when this whole thing started. Talk about it. Absolutely. Um, Kessler Foundation is like family to me now. Um, they do so much to enhance the quality of life for myself and my extended brothers and sisters with disabilities. So uh, they're a fixture in our life. So anything that we can do with them, for them, um, we answer the call. Being one of their ambassadors for the last eight years, too, it's just such an honor and such a pleasure. And again, wanting to just extend their work um, and, and reach the masses, uh, which they've done. The Kessler name is stronger than ever before and the foundation stronger than ever before. You know, um, it's funny, we're in Verona and Scott, um, and I don't wanna assume that because he's pretty well known that everyone really knows um, Scott's story, but it is in this town more than a few years ago as a uh, star athlete, uh, Verona High, I think you were a three-letter athlete. Um, three-sport athlete. Three-sport yeah. athlete, yep. that's right. Um, and you had an injury that changed your life forever. Talk about it. Absolutely. Well, here's the thing is that most people, when they see someone who's paralyzed or in a wheelchair, they th think they've had an accident or injury. Mine was actually an illness. It was a... Uh, it wasn't a virus. It was an arterial venous malformation. So it was a congenital malformation and then just manifested itself when I was 15 years old, just woke up and numb big toe and then 48 hours later paralyzed from my belly button down so it can be an illness it could be a disease there's so many things that could leave you with a disability but mine happened almost 32 years ago and uh, I've been using a wheelchair ever since so the one thing I've always known about Scott um, and a mutual friend of ours the great uh, Ray Chambers introduced me to Scott one of the most extraordinary philanthropists you ever want to meet and people Scott's always had not just a so ridiculous and such a cliche, cliche to say he has a great attitude. He has a sick sense of humor, a wicked sense of humor. 
and he motivates others every day to try to be the best they can be no matter what their circumstance may be because? Because it's people like you, Steve, who look beyond the wheelchair, look beyond the disability and see the person. I, I had someone the other day ask me what I like to be called. Is it a, a person uh, with a disability? Is it handicapped? Is it handicapable? Is it physically challenged? I said, you know what, Scott would be great. <laughs> so it's the more that we can connect with that person, which you seem to do with whoever you meet and other people where we can get beyond a disability. It's not saying it's not something that we don't have to deal with, but when you connect with the person, then anything's possible. And then it's a matter of, okay, how can I help this person to live his or her life to the fullest? And that's what people like you do. That's what the foundation does is just to create a level playing field so that we can get back to work, that we can live our lives personally and professionally to the best of our abilities. Thanks, buddy. Thank you. Great to see you. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by Delta Dental of New Jersey, the Healthcare Foundation of New Jersey, Kessler Foundation, the New Jersey Reentry Corporation, New Jersey State Nurses Association, and the Institute for Nursing. New Jersey Sharing Network, and by Community Food Bank of New Jersey. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. One on One with Steve Adubato has been produced in partnership with TriStar Studios. I cry when I'm hungry because it's really hurtful to my stomach. When you feel sad that you don't have food, like at the table, I feel weird because my tummy starts rumbling. Sometimes all that makes you feel better is food. Mm -hmm.